Welcome to Freedom Church. So good to see you here. This is a lively bunch here. I was backstage here in your hoop, hoop and holler. That's awesome. So welcome to our church. Uh, this is the church gathered. It's when we come and love and support and encourage and celebrate God's amazing grace, celebrate his love for us. We serve a great God, and he is so good to us the way he shepherds, provides, protects. You know, there's a lot of good reasons to be here. Now, when we leave here, we'll be the church scattered, where we take the love and light of Jesus out to those we work with and our friends and neighbors and family as well. So we're glad that you're here. As Danny said, we're also glad uh, for those first-time guests that are here as well. If this is your first experience with freedom, we are, we are grateful for your visit. And uh, you're our VIPs, as she mentioned, and so uh, welcome. We hope this is something that benefits you. Also want to say hello to our church uh, online platform, those who are joining us on Facebook, streaming live. That number continues to grow, and we're excited about that as well. <clears throat> well, the pastor is out, and so I'm going to continue with something he started last week in this series called He Said, She Said. Last week, he kicked it off with a sermon that talked about words that help. Today, we're going to talk about words that hurt. And so this four-week series is actually one sermon with four different parts. And so I've got kind of point two, and then he'll continue that with words that heal uh, next week. Essentially, last week, he communicated to us that there's a behavior associated with good communication. And as you develop in, your, uh, God, in godliness, that will naturally result and come out of you and promote good, good, solid, healthy uh, communication. And it has a lot to do uh, with your words. By the way, if you did not hear last week's message and you would like to, Pastor just created a brand new opportunity for us. Uh, he's now, uh, we now have a podcast with all of Pastor Terrell's uh, messages. And so if you go to Google or Apple and download the podcast app and type this in, so say Freedom Church Online, that'll take you to the podcast. That'll be, uh, you know, those sermons will be a lot of, uh, quicker for you, quick and easy access. And so uh, in case you're interested, the entire Insanity series that we just completed, has already been uploaded to that site. And so you can begin with that and continue on with this series of He Said, She Said. Well, <clears throat> this lesson today, uh, I'm excited. Well, I, I'm, ex I'm always privileged and honored to teach the scripture. Now, not necessarily uh, a fun subject. We'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, we're talking about words that hurt. And something that, that uh, I've always worked hard at as a uh, public speaker, uh, being a pastor for so many years, is uh, things like the introduction, things like the conclusion, and what are you going to say? Not only what are you going to say, but how are you going to say it? And this week was a little odd in, in that I didn't have a clear-cut way, you know, at least settled in my head about how we're going to introduce this subject that we're talking about. I had nothing. And I'm like, sure, it will come as the days gone by, as the, as the Sunday got closer. I still had nothing. I'm starting to think, Lord, I mean, this is your church. This is your word. I mean, you got to give me something here. And so it never came. <clears throat> Until last night, he woke me up about this time, 12 hours ago, and, and said, I've got something I want you to read and use this just as the way to introduce the subject. And so I don't pretend to understand all things when the Lord speaks and tells you to do something. My role is obedience. Is that not correct? And so I think that this passage of scripture uh, that I'm going to read to you is important to this lesson. And so think about that in, this, in, that in that context. As I read to you Matthew 22, and we'll start in verse number um, 33. Hold on just a second. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is small print, evidently. Verse number 33. Um, this is a great verse. When the crowds heard him, Jesus, they were impressed with his teaching. Can I tell you that happened a lot? All over the Gospels, you hear they were astonished. They were taken back. They were overjoyed and overpowered by, dang, no one's ever talked like this before. So that's verse 33. Verse 34, but when the Pharisees heard he had silenced the Sadducees with his reply, they thought up a fresh question of their own to ask him. They were trying to trip Jesus and catch him in his words. One of them, an expert in religious law, that is to say the, book, the law of Moses, right, uh, tried to trap him with this question, teacher. Which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? <laughs> Jesus said, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. 
This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. That's interesting. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then he says this. All the other commandments and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commands. What's interesting is what he just said was every single thing that you read from Moses, which is the first five books of the Bible, the law of Moses, everything you read in the law of Moses, the Old Testament, everything you read in the prophets, which is the better part of the rest of the Old Testament, all of that hinges on what I just said to you. Love God, love people. Listen in the context of this lesson today, and I would say again, it's important to this lesson because at the end of the lesson, I'm going to simply say the cure is to love God and to love people. So here we go. I'm going to talk about words that hurt, and we're going to start with the same verse that Pastor T started with last week, and and it's in your Bible, uh, Proverbs chapter 10, verse 32. Here's what the Bible says. The lips of the godly speak helpful words. That was last week. And, and so th- there's a second part of this verse. The second part says, but the mouth of the wicked speaks perverse things. That's this week. And so uh, we're going to start with a, with a humorous story, a fun story, probably the last humorous thing I'll say this morning based on the fact that we're teaching about gossip, all right? But old Betty was the church member and she was the church gossip. Nobody liked her. They were afraid of her, though. They didn't want to say anything to her, thinking that, well, she's going to use me in one of her stories, you know, and she's going to out me or whatever, create some gossip. Well, Betty made a mistake one day in the church lobby as church was gathering. There was a gentleman new to the church. His name was George. He walked in the church, and Betty was just a gossiping about George because, uh, well, she said it was on account of his truck being parked right in front of the town bar uh, last night, all night, and, and we only have one, one town bar. And so, sure, he's, I don't know him, but he's, I mean, he's got to be, he's an alcoholic. And, and she's spewing all this stuff. George walks in on the conversation because he's walking into the church and walking into the uh, service there. He hears, he stares at her. He wasn't uh, a man of a lot of words. You know, he's, uh, after they got to know him, they found out he was a man of few words. And so it wasn't surprising that he didn't say anything. He just stared at her and then turned to walk and walked into the, uh, the worship service. Well, a little later on that day, uh, George got in his pickup and drove over to Betty's house. Parked his truck right in front of Betty's house. Walked home. His truck spent the night at Betty's house. And I thought to myself, way to go, George. And hopefully, maybe, it would have cured, you know, her little uh, gossipy uh, spirit. We're talking about gossip. The Bible says the lips of the godly, yes, they're helpful. The Bible says the mouth of the wicked, yes, unfortunately, speaks perverse things. The topic of gossip, when it comes to gossip, all of us uh, can say that we know somebody who gossips. All of us can also say, if we are honest enough, we say, I've I've gossiped, and I would tell you, I've gossiped, and I've been gossiped about. Maybe, maybe you're a gossip, and and, and maybe you have a a bad case of DOTM, is what I would call, diarrhea of the mouth, and I apologize for that, but I just... (laughs) I kind of like, like saying that, a diarrhea of the mouth, you know. And some of you may have that disease, and so uh, this would be a good lesson. You know, heads up here, uh, too much talk, too much gossip, whatever the case is, the gossip problem is widespread. And what's interesting to me is evidently, this is not a new issue. If we go back 2,000 years and just stay within church history, Those who have been redeemed and bought and transformed by the power of God's love. 2,000 years, we'll read books, and we're going to read a lot of verses today from the New Testament book of Luke, the book of James, and and very clear and very powerful. They They had a gossipy type of a chattering tongue problem back in those days. If you were to go push, push further back 4,000 years to the time of Solomon, the wise man Solomon, who spoke many of those Proverbs that we're going to talk to them about, you're going to find they had an issue with words back then, hurtful words. In fact, I would suggest to you that this dates back even to uh, creation. So I want to read to you a Bible verse. We'll kick this off from, it's in Proverbs chapter 18, verse number 8. And here's what the Bible says. Rumors are dainty morsels. Rumors are dainty morsels. They sink down deep into one's heart. Now, I want to break the word dainty down a little bit. We, we pretty much know dainty. 
Uh, dainty is actually a positive word. It's a good word. It's a word that fascinates. It's a word that's somewhat intriguing. It's a word that's kind of, I think, positive. When we speak of a, many times you'd hear this talked about as a, you know, a, a little a, a woman who's, so she's so petite, so, she's so pretty, she's so dainty, and she's so dainty, you know, sweet little thing. And so that's what dainty is. I have some dainty little morsels in my hand today. These are chocolate kisses. Maybe you got one or two last week. I don't know. And that's not what I'm going to talk about. Uh, but these are some chocolate kisses, and, and they're just dainty. They're so intriguing and fascinating and, and fun and tasty and good. I'm going to give you all one of these as you leave today. And, and just to remind you of a dainty little morsel that goes deep into your possibly wreaks havoc sometimes. You know, if I was to eat one of these today, I'd start coughing and the sermon would be very short. And Wes would say, well, have two, Pastor. <laughs> no, uh, thank you very much. Watch your mouth. All right. Um, let me show you someone else who's dainty. I have a two and a half month old grandbaby and this is Natalie June. Yeah, thank you very much. A little louder, please. Yeah, because mom and dad, they're in Washington, D.C. area, northern Virginia, and they're watching today. So one more time. Aww. Look at that. She's so cute. She gets my hugs. See, you all wondering where my hugs go. She gets them all. And now she is two and a half, 17 days from now. I'm going to give her a lot of hugs. We're going to see her once again. And she's so dainty. She's, so, so, she's just a pretty little thing, you know. So when Proverbs say, hey, dainty morsel, they're talking about a positive but back to the topic of gossip, this idea of chattering, we're going to suggest, and the Bible suggests to us, that something that is good can actually turn into bad. And that's what he says. This, it's all about, you know, rumors are dainty morsels. They're fascinating, intriguing, and they speak of grace and elegance and all that. However, uh, they sink deep, and they could wreak some havoc. And, 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 and by the way, as a man, you don't want that word being said about you, right? Cameron, Cameron's such a dainty man. He's, he's dainty. No. No, not at all. So we're not going to go there. The word, though, is a good word. Someone comes to us, says something like, hey, here, how, how, did you hear about, and, and you're like, what? And then you're like, wait, what? And what happened? And, and they did what? And no, oh my gosh, does she know? Who else knows? Tell me more. It's been said that gossip can travel around the world and back before the truth can get out of bed and put his pants on. I think that's true. And so here's what I want to do this morning with this talk about gossip. I want to look at three questions. The first question is this, where does gossip come from? And what we're trying to do with that question is gather information. It's just a little bit of data collection uh, and we're tr uh, so that we can have some, some solid base to go from. So where does gossip come from? The second question is this, who does gossip hurt? And still, we're in the data collection. We're, we're trying to collect information to get to the third question, which is really where we want to be. How do we control gossip? So let's start with this first question. Where does gossip come from? Uh, and to answer this first question, I simply want to share some Bible verses that honestly are kind of stunning. They're, they're extremely powerful. I would say even terrifyingly clear. So let's go back to the book of James, James chapter 3 and verse number 6. James is the writer of this book. He's the half-brother of Jesus. This is post-resurrection, first century church, and he is teaching believers in Christ, and they're growing into maturity in Christ, and this is something he warns and challenges them to understand. James chapter 3, verse 6, among all the body parts, just think about what he's saying here. You know, we got head and shoulders, knees and toes, right? Knees and toes. We got body parts. Out of all of those body parts, listen to what he says. The tongue is a flame of fire. And then he doesn't stop there. He says, it's a whole world of wickedness. And he keeps going, corrupting the whole body. And watch what he says. It, the tongue, can set your whole life on fire. For it is set on fire by hell itself. The first question is where does gossip come from? I wish James would be more clear, don't you? That was a joke. Okay, thank you. He's very clear that gossip, the, t the problem of a tongue, originates literally by hell. It's set on fire, it's ignited by hell itself. Verse 8. He adds this, 
it, the tongue is full of deadly poison. So the Bible says those dainty little morsels of rumors you're spreading and listening to come straight from hell. Another Bible verse, Luke chapter 6, verse 45, and, and Jesus is teaching. He says, the good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. That's understandable, common sense. He says, the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. Again, understandable. And then he says, for out of the overflow of the heart, his mouth speaks. Let me say that again. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks speaks. Jesus tells us that our words reveal what's in our hearts. So gossip comes from a heart, uh, comes straight from hell. Gossip also comes from a heart full of evil, insults, criticisms, uh, full of evil. Criticisms comes from a heart full of evil. Uh, in Psalm 109, verse 3, the Bible says, with words of hatred, they surround me. They attack me without cause. This is David running from King Saul, and for no good, understandable reason, he's being attacked. And he says, they, they have hatred against me. And this is important to understand, because it, it could be that you've been genuinely hurt, maybe if someone has shown some disrespect to you or some offense, and, and, and they had no conscience of it, and, and they don't understand no sense of what they did or said of uh, uh, being wrong? Well, the natural thing for us on the receiving end of that is to allow that to translate and build up into hurt, even anger, and possibly rage inside of us. And when they build up, they, they, they will, there, there will be a day when they come out and suddenly we begin to vent and, and, and it pour out. And one way that we release this anger and, and release this bitterness and rage is through gossip. And we hurt people behind their backs by bad-mouthing them. And we retaliate by shooting people in the back with verbal bullets. And so I'm suggesting gossip can be a result of hatred. You've heard this phrase, right? That the hurting people hurt people. Often uh, it's through dainty little morsels of gossip. So there's one more verse, and then we'll get to question two. Where does, where does gossip come from? Here's a verse in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 13. Let me set this up real quick. Paul is teaching young Timothy. In fact, the topic of this particular passage has to do with young widows un, who are uh, young, but unfortunately, they've lost their husbands. And so a lot of them, well, they had a system and a process of getting on a list for aid, for, for provision. They needed help. You know, we come to help and minister to one another in times of need. What he is warning Timothy is interesting because he's suggesting here that, listen, by the way, if they're young enough and they're strong enough, it, it could be that they're on this list, but they don't need to be on this list. It could be that it, it, it would be a, a, a negative instead of a positive because if they can work, well, let them work, you know, to support themselves. And here's what he says, uh, 1 Timothy 5, 13. If they are on the list and they feel like, everybody's going to do everything for me, then they will learn to be lazy, and that's not a good thing. And then he says, and will, spread, and will spend their time gossiping from house to house, meddling in other people's business, and talking about things they shouldn't. And so the thing about gossip is that it's an excessive interest, excessive interest in the affairs that belong to others. In other words, and in most cases, it's just none of our business. And Paul says, no, you don't want to be like that. That's busybody. You don't want to be a busybody, and they're intruding themselves where they don't belong. And so what I'm saying and suggesting is gossip is a product of an idle life, idleness. See, the thing about gossip is that it's excessive. It's excessive. So we know where gossip comes from. And the trouble with all of that is this. Gossip always uh, it causes trouble. Gossip makes the truth unclear. Gossip makes the truth vague and drives us from God. Ruins relationships, ruins friendships, divides churches. And so let's go on and talk about the second uh, section here, the second point, the second question. Who does gossip hurt? We know where gossip originates and it's not good. None of it's good. The next question, who does it really hurt? Well, number one, gossip hurts the person it's spoken about. It's kind of obvious. Gossip hurts the person it's spoken about. Proverbs 16, verse 28, gossip separates the best of friends. And that's unfortunate. You know, it's a ma in a matter of seconds, gossip can ruin a friendship that took years to build. And maybe you've lost a friendship because of gossip. Or maybe you've lost a job promotion or even a career because of gossip. Whatever the case may be, gossip is no laughing matter. It can sting 
It can sting because those rumors sink deep into our hearts. And the problem with gossip is that it's hard to see in the mirror when we're the ones that's doing it, that's speaking gossip. A lot of times it's disguised. We disguise it as a, as a prayer request, you know. And we would say something like, well, it's true, and therefore it's not gossip. But listen, I, I would suggest to you that's not good thinking. In fact, I, let me remind you of something Pastor T said last week. He made this statement, everything that is said must be true, but not everything that is true must be said. Everything that is uh, said must be true, but everything that is true uh, doesn't have to be said. So what if he is a jerk? I mean, uh, does, doesn't give you the right to say it. What if he doesn't know what he's doing? Doesn't give us the right to say it. Proverbs 18, verse 21, listen carefully. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. We gossip about friends, maybe their substance addiction. You know, it's them peels that got her. She's just done throwing her life away, swallowing those peels. Or he should have known better. You know, he should have never taken that first drink. She caused it. I heard she drove him towards it. You know, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Gossip about a relationship. Now you've heard who, you've heard who she's dating, and, and he's been married four times. I don't even know what she sees in him. What's she thinking? And what about him? I mean, he don't love her. He's only in it for her money. That's what I heard. Death and life. Or maybe it's a marriage struggle, right? And hey, y'all, pray for Brother Eugene. He lost his job on account of being late to work all the time. Don't know if it's true or not, but I heard he was visiting the boss's wife, and that's what made him late all those times. Let's pray for him. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And so ask yourself this question. What do you want to be known for? Speaking life and encouragement and building someone up or tearing them down and bringing death because death and life are in the power of the tongue. Most of us have felt the pain of gossip. And who does gossip hurt? Gossip hurts the person that's spoken about. Number two, gossip hurts the listener. It could be that you're listening to gossip. Here's what the scripture says, the wisdom of Solomon, Proverbs 17, verse four, wrongdoers eagerly listen to gossip. It goes back to those dainty morsels because this is fascinating. Hey, I'm interested. And if you listen to gossip, you're wrong. And don't think for a moment that once they stop talking to you, that they're not gonna talk about you, right? So what you permit, you promote. And I'm saying if you allow someone to run down another person, you're promoting what they're saying by your inaction. The Bible is clear. It's wrong to gossip. And therefore, we know that gossip not only hurts the person that is spoken about, uh, but, but it hurts the person that's listening to it as well. Here's the third thing, third per, uh, person that it hurts. Gossip hurts the speaker, the one who's actually gossiping. Proverbs 25, verse 9 and 10. When arguing with your neighbor... Do not or don't uh, betray another person's secret. Others may accuse you of gossip, and you will never regain your good reputation. Well, you can spend a lifetime building a good reputation, but if you're exposed as speaking or spreading gossip, you'll never regain your good reputation. Now think about it. Think about this. Nobody ever listens to a person spreading gossip and thinks or says, man, I'd love to be like him. Man, I'd love to be like you one day. You know, tearing people down with your words and destroying them. I'd love to be like you. Nobody says that. Nobody thinks that. What we think is, well, when I hear someone spreading gossip, I think you have a constipation of the mind, right? Going back to that disease, uh, diarrhea of the mouth. That's what I think. I also think, well, he's, what's he talking about when we're not together? It could possibly, probably be me that he's talking about, you know? I'd better be careful what I say right now because they might repeat it to who knows who, right? Listen, when you gossip and talk badly about people who are not around, it says more about you than it says about them. You don't need to invent things with your mind and then share them with your big mouth. Gossip hurts the person it's spoken about. Gossip hurts the listener and gossip also hurts the person who speaks it. That means that gossip hurts everyone. So the goal should then be to stop gossiping. The goal should be that we not gossip. The question becomes, how do we do that? How do we not gossip? How do we control gossip? How do we stop? Well, there's two things I want to share with you. Very, very simple uh, and, 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 and very, well, 
Some would say hard to do, but I would say we must do these things. Two things. Number one, guard your ears. How do I control gossip? Guard your ears. You can stop gossip with one question. Here's the question. Why are you telling me this anyway? I mean, you're talking to the person who's gossiping to you. Is there a reason? Uh, why, are, why is this necessary? Why? And that question will stop the gossiper. It'll cause them to take inventory. Well, maybe, maybe this is something maybe that I shouldn't be doing, you know, right, right now. In fact, Jesus suggested you do something else. In Matthew chapter 15, or 18, verse 15, if another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, you have won that person back. And so he says, when offended, possibly, when there's a breakdown in communication or relationship, don't go public and gossip and tear down and speak death. Instead, go to that person, talk it out, and get it right. So when you ask this question, have you had a chance to talk to so-and-so, it actually helps them, you know, to reconfigure and possibly see some blind spots and say, no, this is not the person I want to be. I want to be as God desires. I want to please him with the words that I speak. And so thank you, you know, whatever the conversation may be for speaking, you know, for pointing that out and helping me along that way, because that's not the way I want to get. Guard your ears. Guard your ears. Proverbs 20, verse 19, a gossip goes around telling secrets. Don't hang out with chatterers. Don't hang out with people who wag their tongues, right? So the first thing we're going to do is guard our ears. The second thing we're going to do is, is close your mouth. Here's a great verse for you. Uh, Proverbs chapter 21, verse 23. Watch your tongue and keep your mouth shut and you will stay out of trouble. Sounds like something mom used to tell us, right? She said, or he says here, and she said, watch your tongue, keep your mouth shut, and you'll stay out of trouble. Look at that verse again. Just, it's easy. Watch your mouth, keep your mouth shut, and stay out of trouble. Do this with me. Let's repeat that. Watch your mouth. Say that. Watch your mouth, or watch your tongue. Watch your tongue. Keep your mouth shut. Stay out of trouble. Again, watch your tongue. Keep your mouth shut. Stay out of trouble. Watch your tongue. Keep your mouth shut. Stay out of trouble. You just learned a Bible verse. You're memorizing scripture in church. How about that? Watch your tongue. Keep your mouth shut. If you find yourself thinking, I need to share this. Ask yourself, well, would I want someone sharing similar information about me if I were not around? Which leads us to the golden rule, right, that Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, verse 31, do to others as you would have them do to you. Do you enjoy being called an idiot? Do you enjoy being called a jerk? Would you say that you enjoy it when someone says to you that you're incompetent or he doesn't know, you know what he's talking about or what he's doing? Here's a question. Would you want someone talking that way about you if you were not present? I mean, if, if, if we could ask ourselves these types of questions, then it would kill some gossip. Guard your ears and close your mouths. Here's a prayer that I would challenge you to pray from Psalm 141, verse 3. The Bible says, take control of what I say, O Lord, and guard my lips. That's a good prayer. That's a good, uh, good, good thing to pray. Take control of what I say, O Lord, and guard my lips. Listen, why do we gossip? Well, because knowledge is power. And knowledge about people is potentially power over those people. And if we were honest, we would admit that we enjoy holding that power over others. We like to think that we have private knowledge about other people. I mean, that's human nature. I'm saying to want to be in on what's happening. I was amused by a church bulletin I read that said, today's topic is gossip. And then it had the list of songs. The first song was, I love to tell the story. Maybe that wasn't a good way to set that up. Gossip. Oh, I loved it. You ever hear this, the great old hymn of the faith? I love to tell a story. It talks about the gospel of Jesus and the love, you know. But here it is. We're going to talk about gossip today, and I love to tell the story. The problem with gossip, the problem with criticizing, the problem with complaining or lying is you could say the problem is my big fat mouth, but I want to suggest to you the problem is not our big fat mouth. It's our broken and sin-stained heart. Like Jesus said, friends, that's the problem. Jesus said, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. 
What that means is that when you find yourself being negative and gossipy about other people, when you find yourself speaking poison and death about other people, you should think about where that's coming from. It's deep inside of us. It's in our hearts. That's something that's not right. There's something that needs to change. So going back to the Old Testament prophet Jeremiah who made this statement, the heart, he says, is deceitful above all things. Not good news. He says, the heart is desperately wicked. And sometimes we feel like, oh boy, you know, just for a moment, if I could go and talk about someone's lack of competence or somebody else's obsession, if I could talk about somebody else's addiction or someone else's porn problem or somebody else's bad marriage, you know, then I just don't have to talk about mine and anything to make me feel better about myself. So sometimes... When we feel weak and we feel inadequate in our own selves, we begin to gossip and we make ourselves look strong and others weak, which, friends, is the opposite of the gospel. The good news of Jesus says that when we are weak in the way that we view ourselves and we don't feel like we have a whole lot going for ourselves, that we can then lean into Jesus to be our refuge and to be our strength because he is strong. And because he is strong, I don't have to make myself look better in front of other people. My identity is wrapped up in who I am in Jesus Christ. So there's no need for me to speak death. He is strong. Jesus has provided all that I need for peace and joy in life. The work of salvation that Jesus Christ accomplished when he sacrificed his life has rescued me from myself. I'm no longer a slave to things like this, to gossip. I'm a child of God, you know, and I I have no need to speak death, no need to allow poison to come out of my mouth. God and his love has changed me. And so, yeah, sin has made our hearts deceitful and wicked. But in Christ, the scripture says we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And God is all in on us. He's not going anywhere. And so, uh, listen to me. I would suggest you stop living like God is somehow going to leave you. He's not leaving. A lot of times we, we get the idea that, boy, it just doesn't feel like I'm close to God and he's not speaking and where is he? So I take over back, back you know, the, the reins of my life because I need some kind of a control and I need some kind of thing that makes me feel good about myself. And that's when we get into these problem areas. One of the areas is with the tongue. But I would suggest to you, God is never going to bail out on you. I want to tell you that he loves you and he is fully devoted to you forever. And we let him down, and we let ourselves down, and we screw things up, and he's with us and never leaving ever. And in my weakness, he is strong. And when we put our trust in him, we figure out that we don't have to work in order to be worthy of God's love. When we put our trust in him, we can also figure out that God accepts us as we are, and we don't have to put others down to prop ourselves up. We don't have to speak death about others in order to receive life. Listen closely, in God's economy, I am unconditionally loved and accepted by the creator of the universe, not by what people say about me on social media, not by how many posts uh, I get on social media, but rather what God, the creator and sustainer of the universe says about me. And when, we, uh, when, when he gets a hold of my heart, he also gets a hold of my big fat mouth, right? And I go from complaining and criticizing and lying and gossiping to speaking life instead of that, the truth and love over my family and love over my friends and just ordinary people we hardly know. So I'm just saying, I don't need to be better than you. I mean, I've been set free from that. All my inadequacies, all of our imperfections, all of our deficiencies, all of my not enoughs, all all of my too littles, I've been transformed by the power of God's love. I am at peace. And so friends, why? Why would I feel the need to speak death about others? Why would I need to speak death over others? I don't feel that way, not since Jesus Christ has changed my life and he can change your life too. So let's stand together for prayer. And as you stand, do me this. If you would bow your heads and close your eyes. And I just want to challenge you with understanding what Jeremiah said about the heart being deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And maybe think about and consider your relationship to God. 
And could it be that the problem isn't so much with the words that come out of your mouth or your mouth, right? The problem could be deeper than that. It could be your heart. Have you ever made a decision of faith where you say, God, through experience, I've come to know that I cannot sustain myself. I cannot do this life and be successful because of this sin nature. Have you ever reached out in faith and said, God, I'm going to take you at your word that you do love me and you desire a relationship with me. And so today, in this moment, I'm going to reach out in faith. I believe you, Jesus, that you love me, that you sacrificed your life for me. I believe that you desire to forgive me of my sins. I believe that you can forgive me of my sins. Friends, if there's never been a time in your life when you've made that choice deep within the recesses of your mind, heart and mind, I just want to encourage you to do it even in this moment, right now, right here. Say, dear Lord Jesus, I need you. I need help. I need forgiveness. And I'm asking by faith, I'm trusting you, dear God. Cleanse me. Wash me. Free me from sin. Speak life into me, dear God. Breathe your life into me. Speak peace. Calm this storm. Bring joy. Because I really do want to be a good person. I really do want to be somebody that speaks life and help and support and encouragement, you know, but I need Jesus. I challenge you, if you have not already, to make that decision of faith to receive Christ or to just place your trust in him for the salvation of your soul, for the forgiveness of your sin. You're here and you say, well, pastor, I, I am a believer in Christ. I've fallen into this area uh, and, 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 and it's not something I like and I need to work on this. I would challenge you also make a commitment. I'm going to challenge you. In fact, might as well do this now. 30 days, maybe, right? Today's February 23rd. Take 30 days and say, no, comp no gossip zone in my life. 30 days. After 30 days, I would challenge you to say, take the rest of the year. I would just say, you know, make it a lifestyle. Look in the mirror and say, what do I want to be known for? I want to be known for speaking life. Make that decision today. God, I ask that you would bless and minister and encourage and support. God, I also ask that you'd forgive, cleanse, and revive the heart of stone today. God, I pray for those who need Christ that today they'd reach out in faith and make it a new day with Jesus. Thank you, dear Lord, for loving us. Thank you, Father, for um, never leaving us. Thank you for adopting us as your children. So bless your name. Be pleased, I pray, as we make good, solid decisions of faith. In the name of Christ, amen.